This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Today we're going to be talking about treatment of hoarding disorder in older adults. Um, we're going to get very specific about the kinds of treatments that we're doing now at the VA San Diego and UCSD in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And then we'll talk about how to potentially help someone, um, either yourself or someone else, if, if they have an issue with hoarding behaviors. So every time I do one of these lectures, I get uh, giggles and laughs and people think that they have some symptoms. We get a lot of calls with people who think they have symptoms. So hoarding is not a messy desk or a messy kitchen or, or closet or household. Um, all of us are prone to, particularly in times of, of uh, busyness, uh, of having a lot of possessions that may kind of clutter things up. However, hoarding disorder is something much more serious. Um, these, these homes are are so cluttered that people aren't able to really use their living spaces. So they're not able to get around in the rooms or use the rooms in the way in which they're intended to be used. And people have very strong reactions about even having to throw out some of these possessions. So there's very strong emotional attachments to these items. So it's not as simple as just cleaning things up and moving forward. So the, the interesting news is that hoarding disorder has just recently become an official disorder in our mental health handbook. So our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, uh, hoarding disorder is now a part of that. It wasn't before. So we really, as researchers, didn't know how to treat it. It was treated as more of a symptom or, or something that we just didn't know how to categorize. But fortunately now, it's got its own category. So that's good news for us because it gives it a little bit more um, credibility and potentially some more research funding for us. So how it's been defined um, is persistent difficulty parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. Okay, so these possessions can be, they can range from antique possessions to um, uh, empty food containers or um, opened um, blank envelopes. So the value of these possessions does not matter. Um, there is great difficulty due to per the perceived need to save the item and they have a great amount of distress when parting with the possession. So again, it's not as simple as simply throwing something out and parting with it. It causes a great amount of distress. People often don't know what to do with the item. Um, or it just doesn't feel right to throw it out. So we'll get into some of the reasons for saving in a moment. Now these symptoms result in a large volume of clutter. So you can imagine, uh, you know, for people who are older, if they've been doing this for a very long time, that clutter volume is going to sneak up over the years. So we'll talk about the onset and trajectory in a moment. So how does hoarding disorder come to be? How does someone develop this condition? You know, oftentimes you'll hear in popular media or on some of those TV shows that it was some kind of life event that got this whole thing started. Um, unfortunately, um, it's not as simple as that. There's a variety of things that have led to this person 
and, and their current condition and the hoarding symptoms. So it, it's a combination of their personal history, so their family history and some learned behaviors. Um, you know, if you grow up in a household where there is hoarding behavior happening, you may learn that you might need to keep those items as well as genetic vulnerabilities. There's a strong genetic component. So if you have a first degree relative with this condition, you're much more likely to have it. We also know that people have, the way that their brain functions is a bit differently than people without hoarding disorder. So they have what we call neurocognitive deficits. They also have strong beliefs about the possessions, so which we'll go into in a moment what those particular beliefs are and, and how they are reinforced and um, perpetuate this problem, as well as strong emotions and emotional attachments to these things and reinforcement properties. So this is kind of our, our big diagram of how we think this whole thing kind of shakes out and, and what we think creates this problem for people. So again, it's these core beliefs about possessions and learned behaviors as well as genetic vulnerabilities. Cognitive processes, so differences in the way in which we, um, we organize things and see the world and can problem solve. And that leads to different beliefs about the possessions and the meanings. So this bottle of water may mean something very different to somebody with hoarding disorder as opposed to somebody without. And then leading to strong emotional reactions when faced with having to discard possessions. If any of you know somebody with hoarding, they, um, they have a great amount of, of distress when they have to do something about their items. And all this leads to just uh, an onstant, a constant and ongoing condition of saving items and an inability to discard. So what are the primary reasons for saving? I often get asked the questions, why does somebody do this? Why can't they just clean up? Um, well, that's, that's a whole loaded question, but why do, why do people save things? You know, commonly we'll hear something like, it just doesn't feel right. I just can't throw it out. It makes me so uncomfortable to get rid of something. So they don't really know why. It just it doesn't feel good. It just creates some distress. Sometimes we see folks who have, um, they find the beauty in everything. So that pen cap or, or that empty food container or that piece of shell that they found on the beach, that's a beautiful object that, that just, you know, just the object itself is pretty and should be kept. Getting rid of it would be wasteful. So we see that particularly, um, probably that's the most common reason, I would say. So they don't want to waste something. It could be used in some fashion down the road. So they could use that article of clothing um, for a rag, or they could use, um, you know, that pen because um, you never know when you might need an extra pen. So again, it would be wasteful to get rid of that object. The object may have emotional significance. So maybe that newspaper was from a time in your life when folks were happy or it was, um, uh, uh, you remember, you recall a relative reading the newspaper a lot and that reminds you of that. So there's just a strong emotional significance to that. And finally, I will lose important information if I throw this out. So paper is the biggest culprit here because paper has a lot of information on it. There's a lot of words on those pages sometimes. And if that's gone, um, it's gone forever is the idea. So rather than having to face the fear of losing that, people will end up keeping it just in case. Now oftentimes these are some of the things that we see in addition to the hoarding symptoms. So those urges to save and difficulty discarding, we often see these other kind of personality features or quirks as some people call them. Uh, we call these associated features. So we will see people who are indecisive, not just about their possessions, but about everything in life. You know, what do they want for dinner? When should they make that doctor's appointment? Tuesday or Thursday? Just every little small choice is tough. Perfectionism. 
So the, I often get laughs when people hear this when they think about the homes of these people, but yet, but it makes sense in a way that people are so perfectionistic, they don't want to make a mistake by throwing out an item or making the wrong choice. So they don't make any choices. They don't throw out things. They're so concerned about being perfect that they don't do. Procrastination and avoidance behaviors. So people are big procrastinators. You know, oftentimes we have folks that haven't paid their taxes in years or haven't uh, gotten around to, to doing household tasks or things um, because it makes them anxious to kind of follow through with that. And then finally, disorganization. So kind of not just with their possessions, but an overall gross disorganization in their lives. So their schedules are off, um, they can't find things. Um, just life is more difficult for these folks. So hoarding disorder is an interesting condition in that, in that it's chronic, and I believe it's progressive. So hoarding starts early in life. You can see signs and symptoms in children. You can see messy rooms, difficulty letting things go, maybe keeping some items that other folks wouldn't keep. But the thing about being young and living in a household potentially with parents, you have some environmental barriers or controls. So the mom is not, or the father won't let that room to get too cluttered, and they may actually go in and throw things out. Same thing happens, you know, as people progress into young adulthood. If they're in the military, for example, or they're, um, you know, living in a college dorm room. You know, again, the, the space is limited and there are environmental barriers that just don't allow the clutter to accumulate to that clinically significant level. But where we start to see things happen is in someone's uh, 30s. That's when we can start to really see the extreme levels. And developmentally, that may make more sense. People are in their own homes, have bigger spaces, and um, more the ability to go out and accumulate and acquire items and, and that build up to happen. We don't see people getting over this at any phase. So we don't see people going into any kind of remission. So they had this problem for 10 years, then they got over it. We don't see that. We see it as an ongoing chronic condition which is different than other psychiatric illnesses. So you see people with depression or other anxiety conditions that may come and go throughout different phases of life. This doesn't, this stays. And when people have negative life events or traumas, um, that while it certainly doesn't cause hoarding disorder, it can make symptoms worse, which makes sense. If you, anybody has a negative life event and you're predisposed to having some kind of psychiatric symptom, your symptoms will probably increase. Now, f let me go back to that for a second. Uh, now, in older adults, in a study that we completed a few years ago, we found that symptoms increased with every decade of life. Now, I suspect it's more the clutter that increases over time uh, because natural buildup, you know, just practically speaking, 40 years of stuff is going to look different than 80 years of stuff. Um, so the clutter volume probably increases. I'm not sure about whether or not those urges to save and difficulty discarding increase or decrease. They probably remain stable, but the clutter increases, which poses special issues for seniors, which we'll get into. <coughs> so unfortunately, when one has hoarding symptoms and hoarding disorder, probably more often than not, you're going to see psychiatric comorbidities, meaning they're going to have other kinds of mental health issues happening. And most commonly is depression. And Interestingly enough, um, that depression sometimes will, with appropriate treatment, will go away with the treatment of hoarding. So we, co we consider the depression piece often secondary. So the hoarding symptoms cause the person to feel depressed. And if you think about it, you know, if you're embarrassed or shamed about having people over and you're upset about um, not being able to clean up your house even though you want to, but you just can't because you, it's hard for you to get your possessions out the door. 
and a variety of other things that are going in life, it makes sense that people are feeling more depressed. You know, about 20% will see other folks with anxiety disorders, so things like excessive worry or social concerns or things of that nature. And then we see some other things like obsessive compulsive disorder, but most commonly in seniors we will see depressive symptoms. Now what is it that people collect? So again, these are not antique dealers typically, although they people with hoarding tend to be in the kinds of fields where collected items are common, although we, we have certainly treated antique dealers. Um, the kinds of items are typically of limited value. So they are newspaper, paper. Paper is probably the biggest culprit. Containers of any kind. You know, I often joke with some of my clients that they could open a Staples or an Office Depot with the amount of containers that they have. Clothing items, so you just never know what size you might end up being, so we see a lot of folks with all different sizes of clothes. Food, which is problematic if people are eating those spoiled foods down the road. Books, again, that's more related to paper because it has useful information. And just other things like trash, like food, um, food wrappings and uh, other things that would be commonly thrown out. There is a subset of people who do um, hoard animals. So animal hoarding is, is a smaller proportion, however we do see that. Now, I've included some slides here on a little bit about the brain functioning of people with hoarding disorder because it, it really parlays in and it's important when we think about treatment. You know, when we talk with people with hoarding, it became a little bit more apparent that they had some problems with that the, in the way in which they solve problems and their reasoning abilities. And in, in some studies that we've done in, in midlife and older people, we've found this to be true when we've put them through a cognitive exam. And those cognitive exams we've found to be important because we have to tailor treatment based on their profile. So I'm going to skip right to our older people. So in our younger group that I just showed, they often have, they have kind of more global problems or deficits. The good news is in our older people, things were very targeted. So there's a lot of different domains that one measures when you're looking at cognitive functioning. A lot of different things like memory and attention. However, in our older people, we found it particularly in one area and that's in um, an area called executive functioning. So these are, these are kind of ways of, um, examples would be problem solving abilities, um, thinking flexibly, abstract thinking, generating ideas, um, procedural understanding. So this is kind of a higher order level of thinking. So again, this started to kind of clue us in on how are we gonna start to to gain some grounds in terms of treatment. Let's talk about some of the consequences of hoarding. There's a lot of information on this slide. Um, we, what we know about older adults in particular, they have more chronic and age-related medical illnesses. So these people are more sick. They're sick. They, have, um, they often don't go to the doctors. They go to the doctors a very um, infrequently. Some of those reasons are to save the money on the co-payment. Some of those reasons are related to just the disorganization about you know, going through the process of calling up and making an appointment and getting there. We often see medication and dietary mismanagement, which can lead to problems with their, their existing medical conditions. So imagine if these people are so disorganized, it's hard for them to eat three meals a day, they're not gonna be taking their medications appropriately and planning ahead to get those refills in time. Further, they're not really taking care of their nutritional needs. Uh, some may be eating spoiled foods, some may be um, just skipping meals altogether. There is an increased fall risk. So, I have personally fallen in some of my clients' homes and so many of my staff. Imagine somebody with some medical issues or problems um, trying to, to get through narrow pathways in their home. 
So we often do see, again, an increased fall risk and serious consequences associated with that. They have impairment in their activities of daily living. So those are basic activities that they need to do, such as grooming and dressing, being able to take care of those basic needs. They often are very socially isolated. So sadly, we are often, in our treatment studies, one of the few that has contact with these folks during the week. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of which is shame and embarrassment about their home and living situation. Some of it is due to uh, kind of maybe more fighting over the years with family members or friends about their situation and some discord in those relationships. And then finally, we, we sometimes see evictions and, and premature relocation. So these people are not allowed to age in their homes. They are placed into um, aging or institutional care facilities. So some of the special issues that we need to have in consideration, you know, working with the life disordering is a touch more complicated. Um, so we have potential increased cognitive impairment associated with age, greater amounts of disability. You know, this current cohort of seniors is, is actually a little bit more savvy, but as the, as the cohorts progress through the years, um, we expect to see people a little bit more open to some behavioral treatments. Often this is the first time they've been in any kind of behavioral therapy. So they're not quite sure what to expect and they don't, I'm not sure if it will work. Um, we need to consider the role of family members and other social supports and their involvement. Often these relationships are very complicated and uh, sometimes um, distressed relationships. Our seniors are often working with limited or fixed incomes. So if they were able to work and they have Social Security, that's nice, but some of our folks were so impaired, they, they had work impairment and were not able to work. And so helping them um, figure out the best financial plan for them is difficult. Working with multiple medications and providers Again, their life is grossly disorganized, so we're putting all these pieces together is often very challenging for the clinician. And then we often have um, sometimes age-associated life events, so death of spouse or friends, onset of medical illnesses, and the risk of losing independent status. Here's some more additional kind of ones that we see across the lifespan. So other consequences of hoarding. I'll just point out some of the more serious ones. In San Diego County, um, it's, we have over the past few years have had several cases of fires which have resulted in death of a person living in their home. So these, um, imagine being in a cluttered home when a fire happens and uh, it can be challenging for the person to get out and the fire people to get in. We, often, we also in San Diego County have had people go to jail for this. So they're, um, they are prosecuted by the city attorneys if folks are, are not appropriately cleaning up their spaces where it's impacting other homeowners and community values. So if somebody has a yard, for example, that's probably the most obvious place where you're going to get a fine from code enforcement and then they may pursue legal issues pending the case. We often also see in San Diego County different kind of pests or rats. So that's very geographic specific. So I'll talk to my colleagues in Boston or other parts of the country and we all have different kinds of, of pests or rat infestations that are occurring. So in a sample of older adults, so what's actually happening in the home? These people unfortunately um, often can't use basic plumbing and appliances. So think about not being able to use your refrigerator. So how are things being kept cold? Well, they're probably not. <laughs> um, using the kitchen sink, um, almost 50% could not use that, or their bathtub. So how are these people grooming and eating and showering and doing all the stuff that they need to do on a daily basis? Most alarmingly, about 10% cannot use their toilet. So they may be having to go outside or go to another facility or use other kinds of devices to um, use the restroom. 
Often these folks, again, getting back to the medical conditions, they have high rates of health care utilization for the ones that are sick. Midlife people have a greater amount of work impairment days. And sadly, we see these people are often victimized, and we're not really sure why they're victimized a bit more. We hypothesize that it may be due to, again, their kind of chaotic lifestyle um, and um, maybe forgetting to, to keep the property secure and tight because these people do report theft a bit more. Um, we, it's unsubstantiated whether that theft is real or a perceived um, loss. And uh, satisfaction with their living situation. So these people are not happy in their living situations. These people aren't happy as clams live in their lives. They're distressed by this. Most of them are, I will say. There's a subset that lack insight and don't show that distress. But most people know that something's wrong. Now, you know, the interesting thing about working with hoarding disorder is that it's not just something that we see in an outpatient psychiatric clinic or a mental health clinic. Um, this is something that impacts the community. This impacts neighbors, family, friends, and a variety of public um, service professionals. So in San Diego County, we have the Hoarding Collaborative Group. And I was most amazed it was a group, you know, we put out the word about, um, you know, a group getting together of professionals with a goal to help the problem of hoarding in San Diego. And it, it wasn't just mental health clinicians. It was fire. It was police. It was a variety of people, city attorney's offices, other health care systems, geriatric care managers coming in and saying, hey, this is a problem and we don't know how to deal with it. So the fire, fire services are really concerned about this because it puts their people at risk to go into these homes. Um, you know, elder service agencies are concerned about this because these people often stay in their systems indefinitely and it, it's a great amount of staff time to dedicate to these cases because they're not really sure how to appropriately treat it. Contamination, so vector control and other sanitation services are, are very concerned about these issues. So if there are pests or any kind of um, hazardous leakage of some kind, it has to be addressed. And then property values, so that's where uh, code enforcement and city attorneys get involved because um, their job is to protect the public. So we sometimes get calls from landlords and neighbors and, and people are quite unhappy if they have somebody with hoarding disorder living next to them. Um, you know, as you know, my job is of course working with and treating the, the impacted person with hoarding disorder, but again, this impacts a lot of people, not just the person with hoarding disorder. So that we have seen a lot of difficulties in community systems related to sanitation problems, structural issues, flooding, fires, property value loss, and a variety of legal fees. And then again, legal consequences. So, um, you know, these people can be reported to adult protective services and child protective services if there's a dependent person living in the home. Animal maltreatment if there are animals in the home. And other kinds of code violations. So that is one of the things in, that is a barrier to treatment often is people are concerned we are going to report them to the authorities. Um, and um, sometimes we have to if it's a mandated report where somebody's in jeopardy or at risk, um, but, uh, but sometimes not. So we're going to talk brief, we're going to talk briefly about assessment here. And this is mainly from a clinician perspective, but I think it's important for folks to know how do we assess for hoarding disorder. The common lore is that we just go in there and say, oh, there's enough stuff in here. It's, it's positive, and that's not the case. People's homes can be cluttered for a lot of reasons. So if somebody has an injury, they break a leg, and they're not able to clean up and things really accumulate over time, that may be a reason why there's a lot of clutter in there. <coughs> Sometimes folks will inherit a lot of items rather quickly and have to clean out their parents' home or siblings' home, and their home is filled quickly. Sometimes their spouse is hoarding disorder, and it's not them at all. So again, we, it's important to do this assessment to really determine what's, what's creating this clutter. 
And what we're looking for, again, are those two key things, urges to save and difficulty discarding. Those are the key components, not the clutter volume. That's not the, the rubber stamp on the diagnosis. So um, one wonderful website, if people do have particular interest in looking at some of these assessments, if you're concerned about yourself or someone else, I'll put up the website at the end, but the International OCD Foundation does have these um, measures available online if somebody wanted to take a little self-test. So again, I'll throw this up online, or I'll throw up the website online and you can take a peek at it later. But one self-report measure um, gets at um, three main things. So acquiring, and that's something we haven't addressed yet. Some people are active acquirers, so actually going out to swap meets and dollar stores and stores and stores and stores and actually bringing in items. Other people are more passive and they just have the difficulty letting go. And life, as you know, if, you know, if you've been out of town for a week, mail piles up, things pile up over time. So we have people who are active acquirers who go out and bring things as well as the majority are passive. So this scale um, will tell us you know, how bad their acquiring is, as well as their difficulty discarding. So that's that core urges to save and difficulty discarding. And then it does have a clutter volume measure. So this is a very widely used uh, uh, instrument. A quick one, a quick little self-test uh, that is also available online is the hoarding rating scale. It's five items and it just inquires about the core symptoms of hoarding. We use this in our research as a screening tool. And then probably the one that people find the most interesting is the clutter image rating scale. So this just looks at clutter volume. This is not looking at those urges to save and difficulty discarding. So it shows a variety of photos with increasing clutter. And we ask folks to point out what their bedroom, living room, and kitchen looks like. So we actually have different um, photographs for each of those, respectively. And um, we also have the therapists go into the home and point out what they think their home looks like. And sometimes there's a discrepancy. But actually, more often than not, people are pretty on. So people know. People know, again, what this looks like. OK, so now we're going to dive into some treatment. Um, there's a lot of information on this treatment, so I don't want anybody to feel overwhelmed. But we're just going to go briefly over what, what is it that we do in treatment. Because it's often very different than what people anticipate. Um, often people anticipate this, that we're taking a team of students in or there's um, some kind of um, group that goes in and cleans out the home. That's, that's not what we do. That's only done typically when clinicians are not involved or if there's a very serious health hazard or threat, this may need to happen. Obviously, understandably, people with hoarding are reluctant to let this happen. This is very distressing for the older person. Um, and it's not, our, it's not treatment. It's not treatment. This doesn't treat the urges to save and difficulty discarding. This treats the clutter volume only. So I will bet money that we go back in a year and that home is recluttered. I can guarantee it. Um, so, so we see this happen, again, particularly in cases where there's rentals and a landlord must have the place cleared. You know, we certainly see that, um, but it's not the best approach. Medication, so right here at UCSD, um, my colleague Dr. Sanjay Saxena has a medication study right now. Unfortunately, it's not open to seniors yet, but um, maybe down the road it will be. But we do know that there are some effective medications, particularly SSRIs, um, that may be helpful for hoarding disorder. So that can kind of reduce those urges to save and difficulty discarding. It's not going to teach you skills and tools to being able to do able to discard and make choices, but it will lower kind of that physiological level of distress. Um, in light of time, we're just going to skip through a few things on midlife treatment and jump right into um, older adults with hoarding. So cognitive behavioral therapy is, is a form of treatment that looks at how 
one's maladaptive or rational thoughts and problematic or avoidance behaviors um, can be adjusted to reduce symptoms. So cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, an approach was developed for people with hoarding disorder. This is behavior therapy. It does not have any medication component to it. And what the question was a few years ago, we wanted to see how this would shake out with older people. How do people, older people respond to what we would consider this gold standard cognitive behavioral therapy for hoarding disorder? Um, and unfortunately, we found that people did not respond well at all. So our older people, um, some of them got worse. This was a small study because there's no sense in doing a large study on, on something quite preliminary. So we did a small study, and two people got worse, seven stayed the same, and three got a lot better. Uh, but still, that's not quite good. Um, only three people got better out of all those folks. So we concluded that gold standard cognitive behavioral therapy for hoarding disorder may not work well for older adults. But what we did learn is that older people can tolerate 26 sessions of treatment. There's often this kind of myth out there that older people don't uh, want to stick in treatment or stay in treatment for 26 sessions. It's too taxing or for some reason. But it wasn't. We didn't have anybody <coughs> drop. Even though they didn't get better, they stuck it out and didn't drop. Um, homework compliance was super important, so those that did well did the homework. And we suspected that the neurocognitive deficits, so again, those executive functioning areas that I alluded to earlier, were the reason why people were not responding well. And so we tested this out a little further. So again, don't get caught up, and there's a lot of information on this slide. Basically, this slide is showing that people with hoarding disorder have problems with problem solving, hypothesis generation, procedural learning and abstract thinking. And those are the main components that are, that kind of skill set is necessary for somebody to do well with cognitive behavioral therapy. So they don't have that foundation to be able to benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy. And this slide shows this out. So, so again, the intervention of cognitive therapy piece of that they're going to need those skill sets that people with hoarding disorder don't have. The good news is we just didn't wrap it up and say we're going to go home and that's unfortunate uh, for people, older people with hoarding disorder. There's ways around this. So how can we work around this? Well, we worked around it in a few ways. First, we, we realized that the piece of cognitive behavioral therapy that did work was the exposure to discarding. If we have time, we'll talk about what that looks like a little bit more. But exposure therapy for making choices and discarding possessions did appear to work well, based on clinician report and uh, participant report. And then we thought we could teach skills to actually improve or remediate cognitive functioning. So in those areas where we found and we know that there are some problems or weaknesses, we can improve that. And hopefully this will help with compliance issues and, and relapsing back to bad habits. So this is kind of, these are all the skills that we have put together that we believed would be helpful for folks with hoarding disorder. So practically speaking, we're helping people get organized and work through issues and, and solve problems. So the first areas in blue are things that a lot of our patients tell us, hey, I wish I would have learned this in elementary school. This would have been super helpful for me how to use a calendar, how to make to-do lists, and get things done. And we're basically setting the foundation or stage where they're getting their lives back on track and more organized and preparing them for the exposure therapy piece. Um, and the exposure therapy piece, we believe, is what changes hoarding disorder. So that is what we believe targets those urges to save and difficulty discarding. So that's kind of our mechanism of action, so to speak. And this is how it looks. So we start out with our cog rehab techniques. So again, it's working on some of those deficits and skill sets. 
and then getting right into our exposure. And we don't forget the COG rehab, we kind of keep up with them. Again, we want people to be able to use their calendars, get practical things done around their home, work through problems instead of avoid them. But we also want them to learn um, that they can tolerate the distress of discarding possessions and that terrible things don't happen when they do throw things out. And that's the whole point of exposure therapy. So it's a little different than our treatment in a general adult population. Again, the more emphasis is placed on exposure therapy, as you can see on the far right. And more emphasis is placed on skills training. Again, more abstract concepts are not, not reviewed. So the program in and of itself and what we've developed is an individual treatment approach that we meet twice a week and then we go to once a week and then actually we've tapered it down to every other week so this slide is a little incorrect. The sessions are 60 minutes and daily homework is emphasized. So in behavioral therapy people can't just come to a session and expect to learn those lessons and then it's like fairy dust and they go off and they're They've, they've got it. They've got to practice. And, and what we've found in our previous studies is those that don't practice don't do well. Makes sense. Family or caregivers are an important part of the treatment process. And about 15 to 20 percent of the visits are home visits. So home visits are incredibly important because it can become easier for a person to do some exercises in session. But when they get home, when, when, you know, when the re where it's really happening in their real lives, that's where it's really important to practice these skill sets. And we use patient and therapist workbooks. So moving right into what is it that we do, we start with some standard organizational strategies. Okay, again, these are things we could all use some brushing up on, people without hoarding disorder, I'm sure, too. Um, so these are basic rules that we've heard and we've kind of read in magazines over the years and uh, thought would be good ideas, but we actually teach people how to do this because they may not have a filing system. They may not have a bookshelf to put their books in. Some of this basic groundwork does need to be laid. And then we move right into our cognitive rehabilitation. So that includes um, doing practical skill sets on uh, problem solving, perspective, memory, and planning. So perspective memory is remembering to do things in the future and planning for that. So for example, if you plan on going to the gym tomorrow, what are some of the steps you need to take to get everything prepared and ready to go? Or if you have a doctor's visit today, what is it that you need to do to make that happen? as well as cognitive flexibility. And that is being able to think a little bit flexibly. People with hoarding often have the problem of um, if something doesn't work, they just keep doing it even though it's not working. We need to have them identify when it's not working and when to shift and try a new strategy. So we teach people how to do these things. And in light of time, I'm just going to quickly um, skip a few slides here and talk about what we do in our exposure therapy piece of the treatment. So this is the most emphasized portion of treatment. The rationale is based on habituation and distress tolerance. So basic principle, if you're scared of a dog, what is it that we do with people who are scared of dogs? Well, we start them with maybe a dog photo, so we build from a hierarchy. We start with something a little bit more benign, something approachable, maybe a dog photo, and then maybe have a, a, an old, sweet, golden lab 50 yards away from them. And then we build up where they have a chihuahua, and then maybe it's a Doberman pincher sitting next to them. So we build up from least to most feared situations and we expose them to, do, to being in that feared stimulus scenario. And by doing that repeatedly, 
and staying with it, anxiety naturally decreases. We can't stay anxious forever about things. Our bodies just can't maintain that. It's not possible. So how do we do this with people who are upset about discarding? We have them make difficult choices and discard things. And again, it's based on their own choice. We don't tell people to throw things out. It's based on their choice to throw things out. And by sticking with it and doing it repeatedly, over time, they learn that they can tolerate it, they can make decisions, bad things don't happen. That's hopefully what they learn. So daily practice is key. So once we start the exposure therapy in session, they must um, do it every day, and we call this the life, you know, the new lifestyle. So it's not like, you know, it's just like exercise. You can't go to a fitness camp for a week and then expect to stay in shape the rest of your life. Oh, you got that taken care of, it's out of your way. No, this is, this is part of a skill set that must be practiced and maintained. Remembering that this is a chronic disorder, this is, again, it's not something that's going to completely clear up in time. Yes, symptoms will decrease significantly, but you've got to keep up with it. So let's talk about some of our preliminary results. So we did a similar study with um, same sample size where uh, we tried this new technique. So again, this is the COG rehab. Mm -hmm or rehabilitation plus exposure therapy. And after 24 weeks, that's actually two weeks less um, um, sessions, we had um, some great results. So we had very much improved to, uh, much improved at post-treatment. Um, overall, symptoms were reduced by, let's go to this slide, about 40%. So that was actually double our response rate from our previous study of cognitive behavioral therapy alone. So that study, we had about a 20% reduction. In this study, we're seeing 40% on our two main measures. So again, we've doubled our treatment response, um, which is a very good sign. And again, it says that if we individualize treatment for seniors and base it on kind of their cognitive profile, what their skill sets are, we can see better results. Are you, are you measuring the individual stress throwing things out or the cleanliness of the home? So it's a good question where we, um, and we'll do questions in a minute, but we're measuring, um, overall we're, we're measuring both. So we are measuring urges to save, difficulty discarding, acquiring, and clutter volume. Self-reported? And clinician administered. So it's a combo. So the savings inventory is self-reported. UCLA hoarding severity scale is clinician administered. Yep, good questions. So this is what we saw with folks. So the level of hoarding severity, they were at what we would consider uh, non-clinically significant at post-treatment for both measures. So people got better. So this is just a fun case example we'll, we'll talk about in our last five minutes because I know we wanted to open it up for questions. Um, so this was actually a woman named Eleanor. She was a social worker who uh, participated in our study. And Eleanor had recently retired. You know, she led a very busy life and um, worked a lot, it was, it was a great worker, recently retired, and her home was completely filled with clutter. She um, was embarrassed about this. People, only one colleague was allowed to come over and um, nobody saw this home. And she actually lived at another home with her separated husband most days of the week so she could sleep there, but she would come back here during the day. Okay. So this is her bedroom. And one of the biggest barriers she had to treatment was she had some medical issues. So she was quite frail and not able to move some of the heavier objects and books and things. And, you know, so instead of us just saying, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get some people here to do some heavy lifting, we did some problem solving about that. So we, we, again, looked at how she could figure out a solution to this issue. And she decided that, um, that it would be appropriate to invite the colleague who was younger um, over and that maybe they could together remove some of the items. So that worked. She also came up with, there was an issue of her remembering to do the homework every day. She would kind of put it off and avoid it. So again, looking at the skill sets she was learning from our cognitive 
um, rehab techniques, we um, were able to link it to something that she does every night. She watches CNN every night, starting at six. And that's what we linked it to. So she would have the TV on, and that was her cue, that it was her time to do her exposures to discarding activity for the day. So over time, Eleanor became much more comfortable with our treatment team. And when someone is, you know, has decades of stuff, it, it is appropriate when they're at when they're ready, clinically ready, to have more people out there than just the study therapist. So we had, and she became comfortable, and it was on her fear hierarchy to have people in the home, and she wanted to address that. So we had um, a team of people come out and assist her with different areas of her home, not the bedroom, actually. She did this all on her own. And after about 18 sessions, this is what her bedroom looked like. So this was her targeted room. Again, we don't work through every room in the client's home. We work on just one area because we're worried about skill deficits. That's what we want to focus on and urges to save in difficulty discarding. We're not professional organizers or interior designers. That's not our job. But what we do do is focus on those urges to save difficulty discarding. And a byproduct of that is you will have clutter reduction. So after 18 sessions, this is what her bedroom looked like. And uh, now she was able to sleep in her home. So it's a huge quality of life difference. You know, we, we often don't think about those big things that can happen when, when these homes are cleaned up. One of the best ones I had was there was a gentleman who we cleared the living space so he could see the TV from his favorite chair. And that just made him the happiest person in the world because that was one of his favorite act activities. So this quality of life change was huge for this person. Now she didn't have to go <coughs> sleep on the couch at her estranged husband's home. And um, she felt good about this. She t these photos were taken and with her permission. So with people who are dedicated and have insight, this is what the homes can look like. These are not all cases in hoarding disorder, though, unfortunately. If folks don't have insight and they're not willing to engage in the treatment process or don't have treatment available to them, um, it's a much harder course of, and, um, and uh, the prognosis is not as good. So to conclude, we think that COG rehab and exposure is a feasible, acceptable, and promising treatment for geriatric hoarding. Treating the neurocognitive deficits in patients with hoarding disorder appears to enhance response to cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. And individuals with comorbid psychiatric disorders or severe hoarding symptoms may require an intensive or longer course of treatment. We, we did see that overall, even in our responder group. So who can help? Well, everybody in this room can help because you probably fit into one of these categories. Uh, people with hoarding disorder need treatment. They don't need a lot of yelling or advice or distress. They need treatment. Um, so friends, family can refer um, people with hoarding disorder. We have some resources here in San Diego County. Um, elder service agencies, they are more uh, more and more increasingly getting clinicians trained up in appropriate treatment um, measures. Animal control, so if there are at-risk animals, animal control is often involved. Mental health professionals are part of this. Landlords, I've had many kind landlords make referrals and work with me closely with the um, hoarding patient. Professional organizers can help. Code enforcement, fire, the list goes on and on. So it does require community approach and somebody who has that relationship with the person with hoarding to assist with the referral process. Now future directions for this treatment, um, this is a study funded by the VA. We are near completion to a randomized control trial, so this is where people are randomly put into care management for geriatric hoarding, which is the standard community approach, or the new approach I just talked about today. Um, so far, so good, the results are looking promising. And our next step is going to be a real-world effectiveness study, so looking how this shakes out when we take it to elder service agencies or older adult outpatient centers. And the take-home message is that this is a neuropsychiatric disorder, hoarding disorder. It's a, it's, a, it's a disorder. It's not somebody being lazy or messy or being a slob. These people are suffering. Uh, however, there are effective treatments available. And, and the job 
that anybody can play is assisting with that referral or helping somebody get into a qualified professional's office. We know that early identification intervention is, is helpful, yet we've treated people, I've personally treated people in their 90s. So it's never too late to get help and see those improvements um, and changes. So the best resource that I would recommend for more information on hoarding disorder is uh, you can simply Google OC Foundation or you can, if you can read it, there is a website at the bottom in light blue and it's www.ocfoundation.org backslash hoarding backslash. So when you go to that website, there's a special topics section, click on hoarding center, and you'll get all kinds of information about hoarding disorder, how to find a therapist in your community, and um, how to talk to a loved one. So it's, it's the, the last website there. And then we do have a staff of people that you can call our offices and we can assist with referrals. We actually have several hoarding treatment studies going on right now at the VA and UCSD. Um, and there's a variety of treatment options in San Diego County and we have a resource list. Um, so you can simply call that number and that extension and uh, let us help you out. And if you have any further questions, there is my email address. So you can easily find me on uh, the UCSD staff directory. So we wanted to reserve ample time for questions. Um, what was the extension? The extension is 1251. So the telephone number is 858-552-8585, extension 1251. And my email is c-a-y-e-r-s at ucsd.edu. Okay, I'll leave, the, I'll leave the number up. There we go. Yes, okay, so the nature of the homework and the exposure. So the homework assignments we give in behavioral treatment are, are fairly practical. And, and what you would do is outline that with a therapist, just as in cognitive behavioral therapy as well. So you would be, with exposure therapy, for example, first you would practice that skill and learn about it with the therapist, but then that at home, you would go home for a designated amount of time in a designated area, start to go through and sort and hopefully discard possessions. So people will have a box of items that they are already have decided they will start with. And um, you know we can't tell everybody to throw everything out in that box. That's just not possible. But we push people and ask them internally to push themselves to making those difficult choices. So if there's a question about it, take pause and see if it's something you can let go of. And so we have a person systematically go through that box of items, picking each item up one by one and making a choice about it. And then after that's done, they have to put all their keeps in what we consider their final resting place. So we have to have them put away. And if they can't find a place to put away, well, hey, that signals that maybe they don't need to keep that item. And then their discards need to go right out to the trash. And we made that mistake early is that we had some folks that were doing really good with their discarding. And then we went to their house and there's all these little piles everywhere. And they weren't putting things away and they weren't putting it to the final destination. So that's what it looks like and it'll be, you know, 30 <coughs> minutes a day. And sometimes people, for, for, as an example, I've had people start with five minutes because they were so resistant and anxious about it and we just said let's let's start with five let's get in the practice of five and you build from there so we have to meet where the person's at and then work up to that point yes so the gender difference in late life we're really unclear about our first study we had more men than women it was a simple characterization study and we're surprised by that um, and then in our most recent studies we are seeing more women uh, coming in. So it could be a variety of reasons. We're, we're still unclear as to why, but some of the reasons you mentioned are appropriate. Yes, sir. How do you deal some, with someone like this? Uh, I've got a friend, she's 80, very secretive. Yeah. In 20 years, I've never been inside her home. Mm -hmm. That's the way she is. 
and she thinks that it's persecution. Everybody is stabbing her in the back now because we're trying to do something with her and her clutter. We want to get her into an assisted living home, but she's just fighting that, you know, back up against the wall, doesn't want to release her stuff. How do you start? How do you deal with that on a daily basis? Well, yeah, that's often the question I get, and there's no easy answer to that. I would again recommend the OC Foundation website because there's a podcast with Dr. Randy Frost talking about how to help somebody with hoarding and it gives you appropriate language to use that may be not accusatory, um, that will help you maybe join with the person a little bit easier so they're not feeling like they're in the spotlight. You want the person to as much as possible feel like they are making choices for themselves and that they are creating change. And so maybe opening up the question, what would you like to see happen? How do you think we can solve this issue? Um, and, as, and as much as you're willing to, you know, you know, be as non-judgmental as possible and try to be with her in the home if you can, because that will kind of spark a conversation of, yeah, I realize that this is a problem. When you're out of the home talking about it on the porch, that conversation is probably not happening as much. So as much as you can, become more involved in, in um, what's going on with that. But when her mindset is, I don't need or want assisted living, and we all know she does, mm -hmm. I can't get through, I, I can't break through that. And, and sometimes you you're not going to be able to. <laughs> and, and then sadly enough, if somebody is, is um, if they're, they have the mental capacity and physical capacity to remain in their home and they don't want help, they don't want help. The landlord has kicked her out. Okay, so that, that may be um, you know, something that would launch her into to recognizing it's a problem and, and getting some help. Hopefully, the, you're planting seeds. Even if somebody is resistant, they're aware of the problem, they know. And so if you can continue to be there in a supportive nature and continue to offer treatment resources, that's the best thing you can do at this point. Sir, up at the top. In listening to this and dealing with some of this population, do you ever get the feeling this is the tip of the iceberg that we can see, but there's a whole lot of underlying issues going on? And one of the ways I guess I would ask that, of the 40% of the people who got better, did other issues start to develop as the hoarding issue got better? Were there other issues that maybe had their other underlying psychological factors? And th it started coming out in another way. To quote the great Cheech and Chong, I used to be all screwed up on drugs, and now I'm all screwed up on the Lord. And it was just <laughs> passing one right. dependency for another. And I'm just wondering if that's something you see. Actually, we don't. So actually, it was 40 per, or an average of 40% re symptom reduction for everybody. Right. So it wasn't 40% that got better. But um, what we do see, surprisingly, um, even in that first trial where people didn't get better, their depression got way better. They got 50% better. And we saw the same thing in our, in our um, uh, most recent study. So we actually do see anxiety and, and depressive symptoms improve. We see disability improve. Um, we see other kinds of social I areas improve. So we haven't seen an uptick in other kinds of symptoms or, or issues. Um, because probably the treatment is long, so it's, it's a lengthy course of treatment and it's intensive. We're asking them to be very involved and we're doing home visits, they're doing this work every day. Um, so, they're, so if things do pop up, we can address them in that time frame because we're with them for about six months. But it's a good question. Yes, sir. Is there anything other than Paxil that is currently recommended? It's generally the non urges to see. Yeah, so Dr. Sanjay Saxena has currently a study right now looking at Effexor um, and uh, showing some promising results. So SSRIs are, are medications that are helpful for that. Um, so I recommend talking with the, your psychiatrist to see, again, what has worked for you and has not worked for folks in the past, um, but um, but we have seen results with effects or and Prozac. Positive results. Through yes. Medications. Yep. Yep. And so we haven't yet done the study where we're adding the behavioral or therapy and. Or should it be done in combination? It should, it, we with cognitive therapy. We 
think that it should be done in combination. Uh, we haven't done that study yet, but we think we, it should be done. If I had a parent or somebody that had this issue, I would say do it in combination. Yes, hand in the back. Two, two questions. Have, any, have you or any of the researchers that you're working with themselves been a product of the Medicare Advantage Act? Because that's what I understand. So you bring up a couple good points. Um, right now, our study staff, and I know there's not that many researchers across the country that study this disorder, they are not currently in recovery or are were part of a hoarding household. Um, we have started, um, uh, the group of researchers, and one in particular has started a uh, more self-help group where there is somebody in recovery doing that, and that's in San Francisco. So there is a movement of people in recovery from, you know, going through treatment and continuing this on. Your second question about um, what happens long term, we are looking at long term outcomes. So we assess these people three months, six months, and one year out. And we don't have the results for that yet. You know, the good thing about being with these people so long in behavioral treatment is that we can see some of the impact of them discarding to, you know, to examine that area of regret and, and, and those kinds of things. But what we know is that they actually do habituate and do benefit and learn that they can tolerate letting things go as opposed to the fear of, oh my gosh, I'm going to be lost without these things. Those things actually, those bad things that they think happen don't come true. Now that's not to say that that won't happen in a clean out, in a clean out situation. Um, that may likely happen. Clean out situation means their decision was taken away from them. Exactly. Yeah. Good question. Question there? Yes, ma'am. How much does this treatment cost? Oh, so the one that I do is free. Um, but there are, if you go to somebody in the community, um, you'd have to square that away with your insurance. Is it covered by insurance? Um, hoarding disorders, typically people give the diagnosis of something else because there probably is something else that they may put in there as a diagnosis. But again, with this being a new disorder, that's a promising thing because we can start to get uh, reimbursement for that. Yes? Is it hereditary? Yes. Well, it is hereditary. My husband has the hoarding disorder. Yeah. He's had it for 15 maybe years. <coughs> he is now, he now has Alzheimer's. He is still hoarding. Yes. He hoards yeah. on his body, he hides things. I, I see him and he has this bump on his stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that, Lynn? He gets very annoyed. Yeah. He doesn't want me to investigate what's on his stomach. But if a towel, he will take anything. A towel, a piece of paper. You leave your sunglasses or your reading glasses on the table, and they're going to disappear, and he's going to have them on his body somewhere else. Yeah, and we see that with age, you know, if people slip into any kind of neurological issue, is that the reasons for saving may disintegrate a little bit more and people just start taking items without having insight as into why they're, they're taking those items. So. Is there a sense of security, a true sense of security that this gentleman may have? It's generally the urges to save. That's all it is. It's, it's an urge to keep an item and, and they, they may not know why. Yes. The question is, do, do the medications impact the disorder directly, or do they just decrease anxiety and depression? I think it probably does all three. It was, you know, so it does it does decreases it does decrease urges to save, and it might be a little easier to throw things out. So it lowers those physiological levels, and it will help with anxiety and depression. It will help with that as well. So you can get kill two birds with one stone. Yes. Just like the Alcoholics Anonymous has group sessions that go on all over town, 
Is there a group session kind of thing that you can join to do? There, um, there is a Clutterers Anonymous. Um, we don't know the research outcome in that yet, so I would be, um, I can't say I can recommend that, but, but certainly people can check it out. Um, there are some support groups and Clutterers anonymous, anonymous meetings in San Diego. Um, the, the caution is, though, that what we know works is behavioral treatment. Um, so, yeah, yes. Do you think it would be a negative if I just directly confront this person, let them know that I know exactly what's going on? Because they think that uh, people don't know. She thinks people don't know. Should I call her on and say, enough of the BS and get down to the point? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say enough of the BS. No. I, <laughs> but I would, you know what, I, would, I think it's important, you can point, absolutely you can lovingly point it out. And I think it is important to call attention to it if you see a person with that problem. Um, and the language in which you use is important though. Yeah. Non-judgmental, accusatory, that kind of thing. So um, again, look at the OCF Foundation website and it's got some helpful tips. And absolutely, it, it would be helpful to talk with her directly about this. Yeah, and tell her just what you see. That's all you're seeing. You're seeing these items. That's, you're just reporting on that. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes. Is there any relation between race, upbringing, and social um, status? That's a good question. Any relation, race, upbringing, and socioeconomic status? Well, because hoarding disorder is a disorder that we have um, really only started investigating in the past 10 years, we don't know any of those ans answers yet. We have no idea. Most of our samples tend to be um, U.S. citizens, Caucasian females at this point. We are striving to get a more diverse sample so that we can investigate some of those very factors because I think those are important questions down the road. Okay. All right, okay, yes, well, final question. I'm just like, so what is anxiety that you say it's an anxiety also disorder? Why, why do we feel anxious if we part this I, I guess that's what you're saying. Uh, well, it's not an anxiety disorder, but people may feel anxiety or distress or depression. They may just feel negative emotions when they are um, having to let go of a possession or having to deal with their items. Yep, good question. Okay, thank you very much, folks.